So I'm from the Human Rights Research Group of AIST. And today I want to talk to you about uh, the teleoperation framework that we uh, use as my group and uh, how to deal with the manipulation and locomotion for the, our human robot and uh, how to use that in partially non real environments by using what we call uh, task sequences. So the outline of the presentation is uh, first I, I will mention some social demands of hum for human robots that we have identified what is the goal uh, on the group, and uh, what are the approaches that we consider for the teleoperation. And uh, also we'll talk about what was the motivation for us to enter into uh, the teleoperated uh, framework, and describe a little bit our system and as, uh, our strategy also. Then uh, I will talk about our recent uh, improvements and uh, what are the challenges that we are facing. So, so far, we have identified two main uh, social demands for human robots. The first one is uh, the use of them in the disaster response and decommissioning. This is because uh, these uh, scenarios are still too, ben too dangerous for humans. For humans sorry. And uh, even though uh, all the facilities uh, that the robot will have to traverse on uh, and the tools that he has to uh, use are designed for humans. So we think that the humanoids are the best uh, morphology that we can use in those scenarios. However, uh, because of uh, the disaster, uh, the, un the state is unknown, and uh, because of that, it's unstructured. And also, we have to take into account that this, in these cases, the, we cannot rely on the communication. And because of that, uh, a high level of autonomy is required. Second, and uh, recently, what we have uh, been uh, focusing on is on large-scale assembly and manufacturing. By basically, the construction of uh, big structures like uh, planes, boats, buildings, houses, uh, because the other uh, social uh, demands were still too difficult for, for us. So we wanted to improve uh, our skills in this, uh, in this area. And uh, well, this area actually, uh, the tasks that are needed to per be performed are very repetitive and so how uh, precise. It is uh, incredible, but uh, for building an airplane, uh, almost no robots are being used. So most of the work is done by humans, uh, which have to place thousands of pieces in a very precise way. So, uh, and, but however, it's not so unstructured actually. Uh, because um, we know that there is a CAD model of the of the uh, product, and uh, however this this uh, is changing all the time because it's on, in construction. So the goal is basically to develop a practical robot to perform the required tasks and succeed. But how to do that? Uh, there are two sides of the spectrum. We can have a manual teleoperation, like uh, the one w that was used for the HRP-1S, uh, it's a super cockpit. In that case, uh, it's, it was not so practical. There were many degrees of freedom that had to be uh, controlled at the same time. It was also very expensive and required a large space. And also, it depended highly on the skills of the operator. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, we have a system that will work uh, totally on artificial intelligence and will eventually took the human out of the loop. But uh, until now, the artificial intelligence has been uh, proven to work well with a very uh, with only le low level tasks. When you integrate all the low level tasks to perform a high level uh, task, the artificial intelligence is not so good. So the truly practical solution should lie in between. Our motivation for uh, building such a system came for the DARPA Robotics Challenge finals, uh, for which we participated. Uh, well, this uh, figure we ha uh, have been seen in this workshop uh, several times. In our case, uh, we also participated in this uh, challenge, which, con which consisted in eight tasks. The robot had to traverse uh, terrain by uh, driving a, a vehicle, uh, then egress, something that uh, we couldn't do and uh, then uh, passing through a door, uh, opening a valve, uh, cutting a hole in a, in a wall, 
performing a surprise task that in our case was uh, the plug task and uh, decide if uh, going through a um, rubble or uh, to uh, remove some debris. Well, actually no robot uh, could uh, actually uh, take their debris correctly. They were just uh, pushing the debris uh, uh, to the end. And uh, finally, the robot will have to uh, go up some stairs. Uh, we participated as the team uh, AST Nedo. Uh, basically, we were seven members of uh, the Human Research Group, three members from the Joint Robotics Laboratory uh, between CNRS and uh, AST, and two members of Kawada Industries. Uh, those are all the members that participated in, the, in this, and we were very few members. Uh, basically, each one of us was uh, in charge of uh, one task of the DRC. And uh, we participated by using the HRP to CHI. CHI means improvement, which was uh, developed in 2015. This was uh, an HRP2 improved for disaster response tasks. Basically, the hand uh, was different the, the, and the vector. Also, the arms and the legs were uh, longer. Uh, and we had a, a 3D LIDAR implemented as a, a LRF and the head pitch. So the, uh, we had in that moment to create a teleoperation system. Uh, and for us, it was something uh, new. Uh, and the group is not uh, known for uh, teleoperation. So we had to incurs in that, uh, uh, find a way to teleoperate the robot without uh, experience on that. So uh, we had to build a system that was practical in disaster response scenarios. Uh, basically, we wanted the robot to have a semi-autonomous behavior. Uh, we wanted some flexibility between autonomous tasks and also intervention for, from par for the part of the operator. Something that uh, will, will use a very low bandwidth and that will be uh, low cost. Uh, in that case, the, this will be competitive in the DRC. So as you can see here, this is uh, the way we were working. So basically, all the hardware that we needed for teleoperating the robot was just a personal PC. And uh, we, want, we required to do a parallel development for uh, each one of us to develop a task. So uh, we were um, relying a lot on simulation. And uh, one person at a time was uh, working on the robot to test uh, the task. Uh, our teleoperation system, well, is, was basically uh, built on two elements, which we call operational markers. Uh, um, in other literature, it appears as affordances, for example, and uh, visualizations. The operational markers were input to the robot, and the visualizations will give the current situation as a feedback to the operator. Uh, the, ter the interface that we use was Coronoid. Coronoid is an integrated robotics uh, graphical user interface, uh, which allows the user to uh, program some plugins. It also can uh, manage some robot control software, which uh, can be either ROS or RT middleware. In our case, we use RT middleware. And it has an embedded uh, dynamics engine. Uh, for that, we developed a plugin uh, for teleoperation, which had these visualizations, operational markers, and a task sequencer. In the same interface, will uh, where will be used for uh, operating the real robot and also uh, for performing uh, controlling the robot in simulation. The visualizations were basically uh, having the 3D model of the robot, uh, giving us the current pose that the, uh, the real robot has some camera images uh, coming from the head and the hands, and a point cloud that was uh, built based on the measurements of the 3D leader. So in terms of the operational markers, we had uh, four types that were used to control the measurement, the walk destination, uh, the body parts of the robot, and the uh, manipulation or objects marker. The measure marker was basically a box that the user would uh, define the size. And this was uh, used in order to calculate the span of the head pitch. 
which, uh, as I said, uh, was used in order to scan this, the environment. And uh, only this will only uh, retrieve the information that on the region of interest. The walk destination marker was used for uh, placing the robot in the, uh, the desired location, and it had an automatical. Uh, it was automatically calculating the footsteps that were needed in order to uh, arrive to the place. This uh, footstep planner was including an, a collision avoidance system, uh, which basically was working on a 3D occupancy grid map uh, that was used to represent the obstacles. The same marker could be used in an uneven terrain. The operator just placed the robot over the field, and it uh, was automatically um, finding what were the proper footsteps that were needed in order to perform the uh, walk. So in that case, uh, what we did was uh, to apply a plane segmentation on the point cloud and uh, to, get, to gather together clusters with the same inclination. As for the balance control, uh, this was based on the divergent component of motion. And basically, the controller was a PID of the DCM error which would modify the desired ZMP in order to achieve this locomotion. And this is uh, a work play, uh, published by Morisawa in 2014. The body part marker was uh, used for establishing a reaching pose. Basically, we were relying on a prioritized whole body inverse kinematics. Then uh, once the hand, for example, in this case, is placed, uh, then um, trajectory is generated. This trajectory is uh, considering a collision avoidance. Basically, um, each point on the point cloud is assigned a small sphere, and also the body parts of the robot are covered by either spheres or capped uh, cylinders. And uh, by using that information, we can calculate a, a trajectory that wouldn't hit the environment. If the, the trajectory is then shown as uh, ghostly, uh, key postures, and if the operator is okay with that, then it will just execute the sequence. The object marker has two uh, functionalities. It could be used for representation and recognition. Basically, um, it provided the, the functionality of being uh, auto-aligned to the point cloud, and uh, that was, was uh, based on the iterative close point algorithm, uh, including the uh, point cloud library. Also, the, uh, this marker was used to generate hand trajectories. Uh, once uh, you decide if you want to manipulate with one or both hands, you can just uh, move the marker around, and uh, then you will um, find the, the trajectory that is needed in order to manipulate the object in the way that you want. And finally, the task sequencer is basically a way of simplifying and automa automating the task operations. Uh, if we had an automatic script for each of these every subtask, then the task sequencer will just uh, trigger the execution of this uh, sub uh, the scripts. And uh, basically, it has several characteristics, like you could uh, execute step-by-step uh, -step, um, the task, or uh, you can rely on an aut automatic uh, button if you were confident enough. But also, if, you, if some things didn't go well and the desired state of the robot is not the, dis not the one that is currently in, you could also uh, apply some manual intervention, intervention uh, by using the markers that uh, I talked about. And uh, you could online uh, update uh, the task. So basically, uh, the role of the operator is just clicking buttons to decide uh, where to go and how to um, apply these uh, subscripts. So as we can see, there there are several problems. Uh, basically, we have a partially unknown environment. We have a limited communication. Also, uh, the, the sensor that was measuring the 3D, uh, the environment in 3D, 
was producing a noisy uh, measurements, and because of that, the point cloud was not so accurate. So that could result in the robot uh, hitting the environment unintentionally. Also, uh, the robot is controlling, in this case, it was controlling position with PD control, and because of that, there is some steady state error, and we had to take into consideration that. Also, this was a race against time, and it was, it's not uh, good for the operator. The operator basically is very nervous all the time, because if the robot falls, it breaks, and then uh, the, competition, the competition is over for the team. So we came with an effective but practical general strategy that we use for almost all the tasks uh, that we perform. And it was basically using four uh, strategies. One was uh, to have a fast and semi-automatic identification of the objects. Other was uh, to use the visual information just for fine refinement. Also to use the four sensors to correct the identification and parameter parameterize the motion based on the task. Why I say that there is a, uh, the problem was a, a race against time? Uh, most of the time that the robot was uh, steady, or almost all the time the, the robot was steady, is because of the time uh, consumed by the operator. Basically, that's a huge bottleneck that, that uh, impedes to uh, improve the speed of the, of the task. For example, this is, uh, these are the times that were uh, uh, taken by each team for, to complete the block task. And we can see that in our case, we completed it in 16 minutes. But if we take only the time that the robot was moving, it was only 1 minute and 34 seconds. So it was 15 minutes of uh, the operator uh, trying to to check that uh, the point cloud was not uh, near to the robot, that the robot will not hit the environment, and uh, confirmation from the camera to, um, to do the fine refinement. And because of that, uh, the operator took uh, nearly 15 minutes in that. The operator was me. And uh, also, if we take a time analysis, for example, we did, uh, again, the debris task. Uh, this is inspired by the DRC trials. We didn't participate in that, but we took the task uh, as a way of trying to improve the speed of our, uh, of our system. And uh, in total, we took uh, more, more or less like uh, 14 minutes to um, remove all the debris and the truss. And uh, you, six minutes of those 14 were used by the operator. So we improved it, but uh, it still is not uh, as we wish. So in case of the practical strategy, well, uh, what, does, what is it about? So the fast semi-automatic identification, basically uh, in almost all the tasks, uh, we ask to the operator to give a very uh, few information in order to perform the identification of the environment. In the case of the plot task, uh, I require the operator to just uh, put two points on the environment, one on the wall and one on the plug. The one on the wall uh, will be used in order to uh, get the orientation of the plug, and the one of the, at the plug will be used to know the height. Then, once you put these two points, then uh, automatically it, put, it was, uh, calculates an, a guess of the initial pose, and then just you use an automatic refinement ba based on ICP. In the case of the debris task, uh, the operator was just asked to put two points uh, more or less uh, uh, the same distance away of the center. It didn't have to be precise, and then the uh, marker would appear automatically. Then, uh, what's the visual information for fine refinement? Well, basically, uh, for example, in the case of the plug task, uh, the plug is very small compared to the hand. It's actually uh, smaller. If you uh, missed to grasp it correctly, then the, the full task uh, would fail. So I first do, did a pre-reaching in order to, uh, and with the other hand, I also used the, the camera that was mounted there in order to know, okay, uh, the plug is not exactly at the center of the hand, so I should move a little bit up or down 
in as few steps as possible. And then once the, it is uh, selected, then I can make the motion. Also, when you take the plug out of the socket, uh, because the plug is small compared to the hand, it happened that it moved inside of the hand. So if you uh, don't consider that, then you cannot put it back into the other socket. So what I did in that case was to use the camera of the head and the camera of the other hand in order to uh, realize what was the actual uh, pose of the uh, plug inside of the hand and uh, correct that information. Also, we use, uh, normally use four sensors to correct the identification. For example, in this case, uh, once the, we trigger the motion for capturing the uh, plug, the hand just goes to the, to the end, and when it feels the force, uh, the collision with the um, uh, socket, then it stops. And it was basically, it was happening that uh, uh, the identified position of the socket was not exactly the one that was uh, in real. So by using the position of the hand that was uh, when it stopped, uh, then we could uh, refine the uh, identified position of the socket. Also, we uh, use the same uh, strategy for removing the debris. And well, basically, the parametrization was consisting in we know the task, we know what, uh, how to do it. Of course, if we are presented with another task that is not that is completely new, we cannot uh, know in advance what to do. But most of the tasks of the DRC, uh, we knew in advance uh, uh, how to deal with it. So for example, in the case of the debris task, uh, we know that uh, we have to remove the debris out of the truss, and uh, we have to interfere the less possible with the truss. So the best uh, motion is just to uh, take the debris in, by pulling it from in the lo longitudinal axis away of the truss, and uh, this motion was calculated automatically. Also, for example, for, this is for the JBRC, the Japan Virtual Robotics Challenge. In that case, uh, the, the debris was uh, inside of the hole in the environment. And uh, depending on the position of the debris, you have to calculate how to turn uh, the debris once you uh, grasp it. So this is a video of more or less uh, how these uh, tasks work in the real robot. So this is the plug task uh, during the DARPA Robotics Challenge. And here you see that the hand was placed in front of the robot at first. This is because uh, by doing that, we uh, kind of uh, put an offset into the point cloud. We also see that the robot uh, looked at the plug and uh, refined the identification. And well, in that case, uh, the problem was that uh, uh, the plug was very small and there were not enough points in the point cloud to know uh, that there was the, the plug there and not to hit it. So this is the removal of the, ta of the debris in the Japan Virtual Robotics Challenge. And here's how we did it in order to remove it from, from that obstacle. And finally, uh, I want to show the debris task. Uh, which uh, was just uh, for us, uh, inspired by the DARPA Robotics Challenge, the trials. So that same script is used for each of the uh, pieces of debris, and just uh, by calculating the angle that uh, each one is at each point, so we could uh, perform the motion. And uh, for the truss removal, we applied an external force compensation algorithm uh, in order to uh, pull the truss while walking. Okay. So based on this strategy and this interface, uh, we could succeed in several tasks along the DRC, the door opening, the bulb, the uh, cutting the, the wall, the box, the lever task, the plug task, and also the walking on uneven terrain in the DRC. And also in the JVRC, we, uh, we did the same uh, for removing the uh, debris out of the white area and for manipulating the 
flexible hose that was there. Also, we participated in the IREX, which uh, was a robot exposition in, in where we played the same demo like uh, more than 10 times during two days. And in that one, uh, the robot had to traverse uh, through uneven terrain and also uh, over a balance beam and then go to a, um, a how it, turn over truck and pull on a bar that was uh, inside of the window. So from that moment, uh, we started to develop a new humanoid robot, the HRP-5P. And uh, because of that, uh, we were focusing more and more in, into this and into the perception part, into the planning and control of the multi-contact. And uh, we, we were not focusing on teleoperation, basically. So we have been using the same uh, system, but uh, we have improved the perception of the robot. In that case, uh, we improved the localization by using odometry, uh, fusion based on the particle filter, and uh, also uh, environmental memorization. We use the occupancy grid map to perform collision avoidance and the height field to estimate the waist height and the landing state. And this is the, our newest demo of the HRP-5P uh, performing an installation of a plaster board. In this case, we use a real plaster board. Each one of those is 11 kilograms, and actually it's not easy to carry. It, uh, if you try to do it by hand, uh, not only it's uh, heavy, but it's inconvenient to, to, to hold. So the robot is capable of uh, performing this uh, uh, mounting and uh, to grasp a, a tool and uh, perform the, the drill. So we improved uh, the perception and uh, as much as possible the automating of the task. Basically now the robot is capable of doing the task with the operator only doing it in automatic. And uh, it, is, it can be done in uh, approximately eight minutes, which is still slow. It's um, eight times slower than a human. So, we have several challenges, as uh, you have seen. Uh, we need a more transparent interface. Uh, first one, than the one that allows us to input values. We were just relying on uh, pushing buttons. And uh, also, we need a more robust 3D measurement in outdoors, because uh, the lighting conditions affect the measurement and uh, the noise produced lead to uh, unexpected collisions. Also, we are working now on more advanced recognition techniques because until now we only rely on objects that we have in the library, but if we are facing with another object, a new one, then we don't know how to properly handle the, the object. Uh, not only to recognize it, but uh, how to, to manipulate the object. Also, uh, we want to improve the simulation for more complex environments. Sometimes, or most of the time, the, the problem is that in simulation was working, but in the real robot, it was not working properly because the environment, uh, the simulated environment, for example, it was not considering uh, flexible objects. And in the case, for example, of the plug task, we couldn't simulate the cable of the plug. And the cable was important when it came for uh, the real robot to operate on, on it. And uh, another thing that we are working now is on fault recovery. Because although it was possible to recover from unexpected situations by using manual teleoperation, uh, it was uh, very difficult sometimes to overcome these unexpected situations and uh, continue with the task. Uh, as a conclusion, well, uh, our teleoperation system was practical, although it needs a lot of improvement. Uh, we used it intensively to perform all the tasks that uh, I presented, and uh, it achieved uh, the four uh, objectives that uh, I, we wanted from the beginning. Uh, the autonomy, which we relied a lot on, uh, was achieved by the task sequencer, and it depended a lot on the object recognition capability. It was flexible because you could uh, combine the autonomy of the tasks 
with the interactive manual operations. It was also lo uh, low bandwidth because the amount of uh, data that was uh, used was uh, small compared, uh, was small except for the images and the point cloud. And uh, it only required PCs. So it allowed us to perform uh, parallel development. And well, that's all. You have any questions? <laughs>